All right. We had a little technical difficulty, but um, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to let Carol Betancourt come in. I just did. And I am going to officially welcome you all. Um, so here we go. Hi, welcome everyone to our Flash Fiction Open Mic. Before we get started, I want to alert you that this event is being recorded. If you do not want your name or your image to appear on the recording, please turn your camera off and change your name to something else. Uh, my name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. For those of you unfamiliar with Mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest designed to serve the public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. Right now, due to the shelter in place, almost all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that, you get to help our support, uh, the support we offer to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Moderating tonight's event is a member of our writers community, Lizette Wanzer. She is an author, an editor, and a writing instructor for us and other uh, local organizations like the Writers Grotto, the Fremont Adult School, and the Writing Salon. Her work has appeared in over 25 literary journals, um, books, magazines, and she is the recipient of four Individual Artist Commission grants from the San Francisco Arts Commission. So thank you, Lizette, for offering to moderate this evening. Before she says a word, I want to tell you all that questions will be taken or feedback at the end of the event. You can also chat in the chat space um, and uh, we'll try and address whatever questions you might have at the end. Um, otherwise, thank you for coming tonight and thank you, Lizette. Take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us on this Wednesday evening. To our open mic, uh, we have, is it eight readers? We have, have lost Francie, unfortunately. Francie and Jean. Oh, OK. So six readers, or seven now. Um, and I just want to go ahead and speak a little bit about flash fiction because it's a form that I teach and I write it a lot as well. And for some people who may be attending, um, they may not quite understand what it is. Uh, it goes by a number of different names. So flash fiction is one name. Um, it also goes by sudden fiction, which is the name I use more uh, frequently. Um, it's also known as smoke long fiction short shorts, uh, skinny fiction, and immediate fiction. And then there's another category called microfiction, and that's usually really small pieces, 500 words or less. Uh, and sometimes they're even 300 words or less. So there are a number of different uh, names that these kinds of pieces go by. So generally in my Mind flash is fiction that exploits the limits of space. It exploits the space limitations that you, you have. So it makes the most of the brevity of the form. And I know for me, writing it has really taught me how to edit myself more closely and how to write more economically. I have to ask myself, because I don't have the luxury of long introductory passages and exposition, I have to ask myself, does every sentence truly advance the narrative or is it just filler? Um, is it unnecess unnecessary disposable discourse that I don't have room for in this space? And so what it's done is it, it gets me in the habit of getting the most juice out of my verb and noun choices that I can. Um, and one reason I want to get the most juice out of my nouns and verbs is because adverbs 
in general tend to leach the strength and potency from sentences in any prose piece. Uh, and so even more so in, in flash fiction, uh, as in poetry and as in prose poems. The other thing I like about flash is that it taught me, and it still teaches me, to appreciate the art of indirect suggestion. Um, and that's also what I like to see when I'm reading it. If you write a lot of flash and you get accustomed to it, it will tune your ear. It will sharpen your observational powers. It will also hone your editing skills. Um, when you first write the piece and you think it's done, you'll go through it a second and third time and you'll see things that you can take out that aren't advancing your narrative. Uh, it will instill discipline in you and it'll make you pay true attention to detail. Now, of course, it's still a story, after all. So conflict of some nature or some sort of tension has to be in the piece. It has to spur the narrative's movement from plot point to plot point. Um, and most flash pieces dramatize just one plot point and imply the weight of the rest. Uh, and then flash also still has the uh, attributes that are basic to all stories. So characters who yearn. <laughs> Um, and whose personalities are revealed in some way. Um, one thing about Flash is that these stories don't require resolution. They can have a, a cagey ending that either implies closure or they can end with a twist or um, a note of irony. The one mistake that I know many people make is that Flash is for short attention spans and nothing could be further from the truth. It's, it's more like haiku um, or Tibetan tantric poems. So haiku are not very long, tantra are not very long, but you can hardly just tear through them on one reading, uh, whip the page over and then just casually move on to the next, right? You have to digest what you've read. Um, readers have to bring a bit of a meditative strategy to the poems that they're reading. And they should be willing to read it more than once to obtain the full sense. So, you know, longer fiction spends more time with characters and settings. Flash is just as interested in characters and just as interested in settings, but the narrative is just moving too fast for the writing to focus on those elements for very long. So the emotions are condensed, but it is definitely not written or intended necessarily for shorter attention spans. Uh, in fact, with Flash, sometimes the reader is required to do more work, which is also frequently the case with poetry. Um, so just because Flash looks simpler on the page doesn't mean that it is. I know for me, it's much tougher for me to write Flash than it is for me to write um, a longer piece of fiction or a novella. Uh, also, when you're reading or listening to one, um, as you'll be doing tonight, it often takes a lot of thinking to understand what you think you heard, or if you're reading it, what you think you saw on the page. So the challenge really is to tell a complete story in which every word is absolutely essential, and you're peeling away the frills and lace that you might see in longer pieces until you're left with nothing except really the cold, hard core, nuclear um, core of a story. And a story that as a result of its intensity leaves the reader or in this instance, the listener with an emotional experience that persists after your close. So when I'm writing Flash, these are the questions or some of the questions that I ask myself when I'm writing it. How many shades of meaning may I demand from a phrase? How much heavy lifting can I coax from a word? Have I chosen the precise right word? How much freight can I milk from a sentence? Or how much weight can this one sentence carry? Is the writing muscular and clean? And is the writing lean, but still comprehensible? And how can I use subtle reference 
and indirect implications to make the most of a limited space. So many people will ask, well, how long is a flash fiction story? And that depends on, uh, it really depends on who you ask. So in my classes, it's a thousand words or less. Um, many other places will say 900 or less. I've seen between 600 and 1000 words. I've seen a couple of flash contests that say 1200 words or less. And to me, 1200 is a bit long. Um, for me, that crosses over into being a, a regular length fiction story. So it, it does depend on who you ask. Um, but they, regardless of what the word count definition is, um, what editors who are reading those pieces are looking for, they're all looking for meticulous attention to language um, and close particular attention to diction and rhythm and poetic um, devices you may have borrowed, such as alliteration. Um, you need to walk this tightrope between underwriting and overwriting. And that's actually something that becomes clearer as you're doing your revision process. Uh, so repetition, word choice, um, syllabic continuity or discontinuity, um, all have a heightened importance in flash. And the last thing I'll say is that also, unlike typical short stories, um, flash also often begins in the middle of things. So the opening sentence or paragraph makes it clear that the reader has entered or intruded upon an ongoing situation. And the first sentence is often a major hook. So I've got some examples of this type of beginning from some of my favorites. Um, this one is from Jerome Sturm. I get bad news in the morning and faint. That's Jerome Storm from Morning News. Uh, he and his lover were down to their last few T cells and arguing over who was going to die first. That's Kim Adenizio from her piece, Survivors. And this one from Leonard Michaels. When my uncle Mo dropped dead of a heart attack, I became expert in the subway system. And that's from his flash piece called Murderers. So just a few examples of um, some of my favorite opening lines of flash pieces. And I think I will now shut up and we can go ahead and listen to our open mic folks. Uh, Taryn, anything else that you wanna say before I introduce our first reader? Um. Just that, uh, one of our readers has rejoined us. So we'll just keep with the uh, schedule as planned. Um, Francie will be number three and uh, there we go. <laughs> Excellent, all right. So our first reader tonight is Shane Race Leagland. And Shane Race has been a member of the Mechanics Institute Library since 2015, so he's a fellow member. He currently resides in Alameda, and he's got an upcoming novel called May We One Day Pick All the Shrapnel from Our Hearts, and that will be released uh, October 15th this year by Tailwinds Press, and he's going to be reading his piece called Our Imperfect. Thank you very much. It's been a long time since I've done a reading, so I am very nervous. I'm very happy that it's hot, so I can blame that on you know, since I'm sweating instead of uh, you know my nerves. All right, our imperfect. After breakfast, my wife and I sit at the kitchen table. In front of each of us is a pile of pills, far too large for far too large for a couple in their thirties. The pills I take help regulate my blood sugar, lower my blood pressure, etc. My wife watches, smiling and idly picking at the bandage on her finger as I swallow them all and wash them down with diet soda. Then she asks me about a hat, a red hat with a leopard print band. She says she wants to wear it today and believes she left it in the bedroom closet. I tell her that this is nonsense, that I saw it in the hallway closet just that morning. She asks me to check just to make sure. I walk down the hall to our bedroom, close the door behind me and count to 20. 
When I return to the kitchen, she has turned on the radio and now bounces in her seat along to the music. She is wearing the red hat. All her pills are gone. In our six years of marriage, my wife's pride still doesn't allow me to watch her take her pills. In our first year of marriage, I was terrified that she was dumping them. On days I was alone, I often took the trash out to the garage, slit open the bag and sifted through it, looking for the flash of little white pills. I never found any. I have grown to trust her, and I have also grown to enjoy our daily, da daily game of distractions. As we leave the house, each headed to our separate jobs, we see a group of children at a bus stop. They laugh and shove each other playfully. There is joy and longing in my wife's left face. But when she notices me looking at her, she drops her gaze to the ground. Several hours later, my wife calls me at work. Over the phone, my wife says that she just read an article about diet soda, how it was bad for you and it could put you at a risk for diabetes. I laugh and tell her it was too late for that. She also tells me that she had decided to throw away the cutting board. She had cut her finger quite badly two days prior while chopping green peppers, and although we had disinfected the board three times with bleach and water, it was, after all, made of wood, and wood is porous. I ask if she is tired. She says, yes, a little. Why? I say no reason. No reason. I say that I love her and will see her after work. Before I hang up, she reminds me of my quarterly screening. After the phone call, I go into the break room, pour out the rest of my diet soda and recycle the bottle. The screening does not take long. A medical assistant swabs my gums and I wait for the results reading a magazine 10 years out of date. Uh, 10 years out of date. My wife is very pleased that the test came back as usual negative. We go out to dinner to celebrate. Then we hurry home to make love. She falls asleep immediately afterwards. I knew that she was tired. I had been on the other side of the bathroom door the night before as she cried until four in the morning. It had been my fault. I had brought up children again. That there was always artificial insemination, but with a low viral load and me being on Truvada made the risks to me almost negligible if we tried to conceive the natural way. Her response was the same, one in four, that, that e even with a low viral load, there was a one in four chance that the child would end up inheriting her disease, one in four. I get up out of the bed and head to the bathroom. There I dispose the condom and nitrile gloves in a bin we use for everything that touches her fluids. I sit on the edge of the bathtub and stare at myself in the mirror. What do I say? How do I make her understand that a 75% chance is a pretty damn good odds and even if we hit that one in four, there is a 100% chance that we would love that child unconditionally. That if we mixed our two imperfect bloods, there was a chance we could make a perfect human being. I go back into the bedroom and call into, crawl into bed next to her. At my touch, my wife rolls over and wraps her arms around me. She remembers something in her sleep. I close my eyes and drift off to join her. Thank you very much. I believe you're on mute, Lizette. <laughs> I said, thank you. You didn't look nervous reading that at all. Not at all. Nicely done. All right. Moving on to our next reader, Linda Hartman. There she is. Uh, Linda Hartman has worked as a critical care, emergency room and pediatric uh, ICU and transplant nurse um, in San Francisco for 15 years before working as a scientist at Genentech, which is in uh, South San Francisco near the a beautiful marina there. She worked on the first approved targeted antibody for cancer and went on to become director and senior director for other biotech companies, developing departments of pharmacovigilance medical affairs and dosimetry, overseeing infrastructure and mentoring of physicians, pharmacists, and other clinical staff while working on the development of other medical and cancer therapeutics, including vaccines. 
So after retiring, she took up creative writing, and now she's president of the CWC in Mount, or the California Writers Club uh, in Mount Diablo, the Mount Diablo branch. And Linda is going to be reading tonight a piece called Mother Sent Us to Our Rooms. Thank you very much, Lizette. Um, I too um, haven't actually done Flash before, and I got a lot out of the talk that I wish I had had before I wrote this. Uh, so I'm going to sit down and rewrite it really fast here before I read. Excuse me while I do that. No, kidding. So I'll do that afterwards. It'll be much better next time around. So Mother Sent Us to Our Rooms. Pandemic plague, plague past protections, protests, police perpetrations, parlays plenty, parties painful, provoking, perturbing, pessimistic, poisonous, pestiferous, and perforated. It is March 1st, 2020. Heather looked up from the news on the web. She called Monique her best, best friend. I'm serious, she said. The guy died. The first death here in the United States with it. Um, if it's what, if what you're saying is true, it's traveling because that's what people do. But it's gotta be human spread too because the guy said he wasn't at the market or anybody who was at the market and, or wasn't with anybody who was at the market in Wuhan. The two of them huddled in the weeks to come like CIA agents sharing everything they could find out about it. It was just 12 days later that the health department and Contra Costa put a shelter in place order for all the residents. The two could no longer meet in person without breaking orders or risk getting a misdemeanor for it. Both though had been out with their masks on and their gloves on before masks were even mandatory. They needed to stock up the shelter in place for as long as possible. Prepare for the worst and you will always be pleasantly surprised at the outcome was Heather's motto. She told Monique, I could build a bomb shelter if I could, but I'm a peaceful person. I'd have to fend off the gun-loading people, the gun-toting people who'd eventually come for my survival rations. And well, I'm not going to get a gun just to do that. Everybody's got to eat, so just take the food already. I'd be the first to say, just kill me if it came to cannibalism. Comparing daily stories of shopping versus ordering groceries in and getting them wiped down and moved from the dirty zone to the clean zone with each other gave some balance and levity to their otherwise newly sheltered in lifestyle. Each retired, they both kept up with family in other parts of the United States and friends in other countries where things were different. Gave them plenty to worry about. Then came the murder of George Floyd the black man in Minneapolis, murdered by white policemen, on show for the world to view. I can't breathe. Have you been watching? Monique phoned Heather. Look, I don't even know what to say. This has got to stop. Is that all you got? Monique yelled. You don't even call me? No, but I don't know what to say. I'm just so sorry, Monique. It's not fair. It's, it's wrong. I don't get it either. And I'm worried as hell now. What's going to happen? Oh, I don't spoke up. Are you going out? I have to. You coming? I don't know. I feel like I need to, but. Somebody's got to take care of you if you get sick or thrown in jail. Those are my peeps, Heather. I got to. You're my peeps too, Mom. I don't blame you or anybody for going out over this. The timing sucks, though. But no timing is good timing. So many convergences of factors right now, you know. I know. I'll be in touch. But be careful in the area. Wear your mask and stay out of her. No need to up. The next weeks were fraught with more ridiculous COVID remarks from the executive branch. 
and divisive speeches too. It was infuriating to the two friends trying to cope with others who had come down with the disease both far and near. As the election was drawing closer, they were glued to the news like junkies. While filling out postcards, Zooming with friends and family, and taking themselves out for the occasional meditative walks, stay separately to rebond with Mother Nature and enter a better headspace. Mommy, seriously, why are things so bad in our country? I hear from my friends in Europe and then, look, Heather, don't you really get it? Get what? It's Mama, honey. She is doing this because we need it. Mom, I'm sorry, but I think you lost me. We're sheltered in right, Heather. You see, Mother Nature has sent us to our rooms. This planet and the people here need one big reset. We are not supposed to come out until we can respect each other enough to stop arguing about wearing masks in grocery stores. Thank goodness it's mandated here. You and I stop seeing each other, right? Out of love and out of respect. People work from home now. We stop traveling. People are losing their jobs and their businesses. There's less pollution as a result. Now, am I right? The ozone is happier. Hopefully, we'll see beauty in every color of every flower. That every walk will have more meaning because we can. We can walk. If people can walk, they should be able to appreciate all the colors of the ice cream there are. Now, am I right? Why all the craziness and judginess over skin color? Well, why isn't the oval doing more? Well, whether due to ignorance or laziness or greed or need, it's still our responsibility to ensure that no matter what help is offered, domestic or foreign, that this remain a history that never repeats. Rain or shine, sickness or health, we must find a way to vote in November and begin our journey by planning for it now. But it's the elderly and the prisoners and the people of color and the poor. Those living in those crowded circumstances that it's affecting the most. We read the news, we know the junkies. That's right. Well, now you're thinking. Sounds sort of like genocide, don't you think? Well, now that's an awful thing to say. And it's an awful way to feel, too. So to help the ignorant become informed and get rid of the magical thinking coming from the over, get rid of the divisiveness and find some commonalities. Call the bad trouble for what it is and stop the government. Cover us. We gotta be willing to get into some good trouble if need be. John Lewis. I think it's called getting open and getting honest to help those who need it the most. This problem is systemic and it isn't getting fixed from the top. Well, Mommy, it sounds to me like Mama is trying to tell us to stop being so selfish. I think I'm going to go and call a senator. And then I'm going to call a friend I haven't checked in with for a while. See if I can drop some soup off to her. I think I feel like I just got to stop somewhere. But do you think we could get together and make a list tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Do you have a theater background? I'm sorry. Do you have a theater background? No. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was my kind of first class and a uh, theater background. <laughs> my sister keeps telling me I should go in. Okay. <laughs> it would be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. We have Francie Covington. Hi, Francie. Hello. Uh, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay, that's right. Yay. Uh, Francie is a retired uh, TV producer of magazine and public affairs shows. I'm going to mute myself. She's currently working on a collection of short stories. Her personal essay called Uneasy Lies the Head of the Black Mom. Uh, appeared in Ms. Magazine last month. Congratulations. Thank you. And Francie will be reading for us. Oh, she's reading that piece. Excellent. Yes. Uh, Uneasy Lies the Head of the Black Mom, which appeared in Ms. Magazine. Take it away. 
Okay, thank you, Lizette. I listen in the night for the return of my son, who is out with his friends for the evening. I don't worry about his non-Black friends. They're congenial, working hard at their first jobs post-college, just as he is. I worry about those who don't know my son, never had a chat with him. I worry that his insistence on his right not to be hassled, arrested, or beaten by police without cause will be seen in and of itself as an act of aggression. I fear any interaction he might have with police officers who lean more toward the warrior code than their public service mandate. As the daughter of a black man, the widow of a black man, and the mother of a black man, I have lived in a state of anxiety about the safety of the men in my life for my entire life. I've had to teach my son that whenever he goes into a store, even if it's raining outside, he must slide his hoodie off his head and leave it off until he leaves the premises. He has to take his hands out of his pockets while waiting for the cashier to ring him up. He must put his purchases in a bag, not walk out of the store with them in his hands and always, always get a receipt and do not discard the receipt until he gets home. I tell him that people are blinded by suspicion of all black males over the age of five. They can't tell the robbers from the fraternity guys, the shoplifter from the man who doesn't want a bag because he plans to immediately drink the bottle of water and eat the chips he's just purchased. But someone might challenge him, calling him a thief. I remind him that he has to think not only for himself, but for people who will assume he's a criminal or just up to no good, because that's what they've been told. You'll be considered dangerous until you're well into your 70s. About the police, I say, make sure your phone is on and fully charged before you leave the house. If you see the flashing lights of a police vehicle behind you, activate your phone, pull over, and place your hands on the steering wheel. If you're a passenger in the car, at all times, keep your empty hands where the police can see them. Again, make sure your phone is recording. He says, mom, you worry too much. I think, I hope I haven't left anything out. There is such a thing as beautiful, loving sons like mine. Just as there are such things as tasers, lethal weapons, centuries old assumptions and racism, racism handed down casually and yes, sometimes intentionally by millions of other moms and dads. I know that after he's received a graduate degree, married and had children of his own, even then I will worry because his blackness will not have faded. When the downstairs door finally opens and the hushed steps to his room recede down the hallway, I take my first deep breath of the night, relieved that at least on this night, my son's name will not be preceded by a hashtag. Thank you. Thank you, Francie. That Thank was extremely powerful. Thank mm -hmm. you. And sobering. 
Thank you. All right, moving on to our next reader, who is Mitchell Toes. I hope I said it correctly. Mitchell That's lives. In, it is? Yes. Mitchell lives and writes Lakeside in Manitoba, Canada. Mm -hmm. His writing has appeared in a variety of literary journals, oh, and anthologies. Uh, he is currently working on an ectrastic uh, art book containing photography and short fiction, mm -hmm. as well as a third edit on his novel, which is called Mulholland and Hardbar. Uh, he says to follow him on the trails, the water, across the winter ice, or more conveniently at, I think this is his website, michellaneous.com, uh, or Facebook, LinkedIn, Goodreads, and Twitter. And Mitchell will be sharing with us tonight his piece called Freight Trains and Jet Planes. Mitchell. Thank you, Liza. I built a writing room for myself during the pandemic. I wanted to have some outdoor work, be productive, and get up to my collarbone in something that took my mind off the talking heads on TV. Only five by 12, the addition occupies a shady spot attached to the gable end of our repurposed boathouse, now a not so big lakeside screen porch. The boathouse was built originally in 1975 a mini-me to the 1950 cottage. Both were built with lumber salvaged with care from decommissioned Canadian National Railroad boxcars. The reclaimed lumber is all clear Douglas fir, rare now and still strong, straight and warm to the touch. Having removed two sliding patio doors in the cottage, I put all four glass panels into the tiny addition as fixed windows. Complemented by an old oak door, my little retreat is well fenestrated and the light fandango. I have a view of the lake and it can see me too with its infinite number of twinkling summer eyes. I sit behind the glass separated from the boreal riparian zone, a low lying fringe of willow, flowering dogwood, poplar and shy lady slipper. I'm cut off, but still a part of the, for of the forest community. It's not unlike those clear flat screens that have sprung up like plexiglass weeds in stores and banks, and even at your favorite hole in the wall pizza joint. It's a good place, my addition is, to write. Quiet, but for the sound of rushing poplar leaves in the wind, dappled light all around with the live feel of sawn wood embracing me in a way that no plastic no metal, no composite could. The fur boards may not have a heartbeat or flowing sap, but they nonetheless feel like kin in the family of living things, especially here in a glade green and warm with sunlight. I inhale a whiff of milkweed tended by an escadrille of bees, and I set the CD player on random. You can't jump a jet plane like you can a freight train, rings out filling the little shed and my head with wonder and all manner of thoughts that criss and cross like contrails that until recently left their chalky residue on the blue dome above me. I sit still as a cloud. I listen as Lightfoot repeats the phrase. My heart is filled and bursting and I feel sad, but the lonesome beauty of it sweeps me up. Man, I love that song, I say. And I'm pretty sure I hear a chorus of tamarack pine reply, us too. At night, I listen to the pulse of the lake, a light breeze keeping a slapping beat going, echoing up from the sand shore. I toss up the cupboard to feel the air on my bare legs and wonder about that verse, about a freight train and a jet plane. I think of the sky, blue today as it was over my Little League baseball games from 50 some years ago. The ashy gray is washed out now because the planes are grounded and it's blue like it used to be. Blue like it bloody well means it. 
Sure, we all need those jet planes. There's no doubt. But it's nice not to have smoke and soot and poisonous confetti littering the sky. Then I think of the people at home with families and Monopoly and Catan and lunch is ready and let's plant a garden. I'll be damned if I don't hear the unmistakable clang of a ringer in a backyard horseshoe, horseshoe pitch. A talisman not hung over a door, but executing three and a half somersaults through the barbecue scented air of a 2020 Walden. You can't jump a jet plane like you can a freight train, I sing aloud in my 60 square foot time capsule. Tumbling through the void like I was John Glenn and the world's COVID hiatus was space uncluttered by earth junk in slowly eroding orbit. Maybe the technology and the mad consumption of kitschy trash that arrives at our front doors by whirring drone is not exactly the normal that we should be so goddamn interested in returning to. Maybe the true blue sky and figuring out math in our kids grade six textbook and darning a sock is the next life balance article we can read on LinkedIn. Yeah, maybe that's what Lightfoot had in mind back in 66. Back when technology was just beginning to be an omnipresent, unrelenting source of interference, blocking us from our own humanity. Maybe the codgers in front of my hometown post office had it right, and the old ways were the best. And maybe we don't need, do not absolutely have to have a three car garage stuffed like chipmunk cheeks with BPA and chlorine disguised as all manner of camouflage painted plastic gigaws that promise to make our lives better. Of course, maybe this apparent reawakening of nature could just be a ruse and we're all fucking gonna die of the coronavirus. If so, I'll go down swinging, but in a different way. I'll learn from the bull low gear we are in right now and slow down. Feel the rain on my face. Pick myself up, find my friends, hold them close. Build my life around family. Live simple. Maybe I can once again pound the nails out of a hunk of ancient wood and reuse it, honoring the incredible chain of natural events that locked the sun into it in the form of carbon before my mom's great grandma was, was born, before microplastic existed before unexpected extinctions, nutrient depleted soil, and before that pile of empty plastic water bottles as big as Mount Robson was something we had created and no one knows exactly why. My thanks to the Mechanics Institute. Thank you. That was a very sensory laden piece, which I love that. I love having the five senses on as many pages as possible. Thank you. Moving on, our next reader is Simon Menkes. Is Simon here? I am, I'm right oh, here. Okay. Simon is a writer whose stories are as much about the journeys his characters take as the as the goals they achieve. He has just completed Cushland, a novel about a conservative young man from Georgia who inherits part ownership in an LA cannabis dispensary. Um, based out of LA, Simon practices karate, Shotokan? Shotokan? Oh, Shotokan, yes, a little bit of Shotokan. All right, uh, tennis, and accounting in his spare time. Yes. Simon is going to read for us, I love this title, Coffee and COVID. <clears throat> Madison's and my favorite coffee shop closed during the pandemic. This is what happened when we decided to give a damn. My name is Austin Charles Hardy. I'm 16 and I live in Oak Cove, not far from San Francisco. My new girlfriend, Madison, and I had started playing tennis twice a week at the municipal courts. After playing, we'd get coffee at Perk Up, where we had our first date, and sit at their tables outside since inside seating isn't allowed. Perk Up 
is owned by Pan, who's in his 20s. Whenever we'd walk in, Pan would announce, well, hello, Madison and Austin, like we were royalty. And he always remembered Maddie loves lattes and I love ice blended mochas. Four days ago, though, we went there and it was dark inside. A handwritten note taped to the door said, closed due to coronavirus. Today around lunchtime, I got a text from Maddie. I can't stand it anymore. We have to find out what happened to Pan. Meet me in 10 minutes with your skates on. I walked to where our two streets intersect and she was already there. She fixed me with her large gray blue eyes. Where's your skates? Don't know, I said, shaking my head. They're not where I put them. She tossed her curly brown hair. And you're late. I stared at her. Maddie can get testy when she's upset. She grabbed my bicep and leaned into me. I'm sorry, Austin. It's just that I told my parents pan closed because of the coronavirus, and they looked at me like, and your point is? Yeah, I know. I told my parents, too. Buck was like, I read that 50 businesses have closed here in the last five months, some pretty successful before COVID. Interesting. Maddie frowned. Your dad said, interesting? I nodded. At least my mom was like, I'm sorry you lost your favorite place, sweetheart. Your mom's cool. The truth was tons of places had closed in Oak Grove, like the gyms, movie theaters, and a bunch of restaurants. And we didn't know whether they'd open one day or be closed forever. What if Oak Cove never had another movie theater ever again? How crazy would that be? I walked as Maddie slowly skated and we made our way to the quiet end of Main Street near the courts. It's just that everyone seems to be, I don't know, numb, Maddie said. Yeah, like they're in shock or something, or they don't care. Maddie frowned. I don't want to be like that. That's why we have to find Pan, see what happened to him. We came to perk up. A small pile of mail lay inside on the floor by the door. Maddie sighed. Their phone just rings. I wish we knew where he lived. Wait here, I said. I walked around one side of the building and searched the alley for something long and skinny. I found an old coat hanger. I'm lucky that way. I can always find odd, helpful shit. At the front of the cafe, I made a hook with the coat hanger and stuck it under the door, dragging out each envelope. One envelope was from the state of California. You're not going to open that, are you? Maddie whispered and nodded, her blue eyes big like spring swimming holes. Gotta break eggs to make omelets. I ripped open the envelope and pulled out a statement of information form listing Pan Jen as owner with an address 10 blocks away. Austin, you're brilliant. I stuffed the paper in my pocket and slid the other mail back under the door. Maddie grabbed my hand. Come on. We found the address on the form and walk skated up to an old eight unit apartment building knocking on Pan's door. Pan? Maddie called, are you in there, Pan? Pan appeared at the side of the building and stopped six feet away from us. He had a mask on and his dark eyes were wide and his eyebrows raised. We quickly put our masks on too. Madison and Austin, Pan said, why are you guys here? I showed him the form. Someone taped this on your door, I said, lying like a criminal. It looked important, so we brought it to you. My mom, who's totally against lying, says white ones are okay if they help people. Maddie nodded vigorously like a bobblehead after a dozen lattes. Pan glanced at the form. Uh, you guys want to come around back for a moment? He didn't look like he wanted us to, but that's how good a host he is. Sure, Maddie said. Pan led us to a rear yard with a wood picnic table. A big man in a mask sat at the table, his back to us. He turned around. It was Buck. Mr. Hardy, Maddie squealed. These are the kids you were talking about? Pan asked Buck. Dad, 
What are you doing here, I asked, shocked. My dad stood up. I'm starting an opportunity fund with some friends. I knew you loved Perk Up, so I had the Chamber of Commerce connect us. What brings you two here? Buck's hair looked messed up, and I noticed one knee of his jeans was torn. I sidestepped his question. What happened, I asked, pointing to his jeans. And where's your car? He gestured to some inline skates nearby. My skates. Thought I'd give these a try since you and I wear the same size shoe. He shrugged. I had a little spill. After the fuss he and my mom always made, I couldn't help myself. Jeez, Dad, I shook my head. No pads or helmet. Buck just stared at me with a guilty expression. And that's how Pan reopened Perk Up. My dad's new group became partners with him and invested some money. Cool, right? Now, if only I can get him excited about owning a movie theater. Thank you. That was hilarious. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. A little YA story about the pandemic. <laughs> I loved that. Thank you. All right, we are now up to Cindy Zickmund. And I don't know if she is here. Oh, there she is. Cindy's essays have been published by The Literary Traveler and the uh, current issue of Magnolia Review due out this month. She was the creative nonfiction editor for Q Literary Magazine during 2018 and 19. And she's currently a contributing writer for the Southern Review of Books. Her day job, she is the competitive intelligence manager at ServiceNow. And she lives with her husband and two rescue pups in Woodside. Cindy is going to be reading for us today a piece called Release All Claims. Cindy? Thank you, Lizette. I enjoyed your lecture earlier on, and I wish I had heard it a couple weeks ago. Release All Claims. On Tuesday, January 28th, 2020, my cell phone rang at 9.30 a.m. It was my manager. Reports of my software company's annual layoff had already appeared on layoffs.com. The event started in Asia, traveling faster than the coronavirus infecting its way to Palo Alto. For the past year, my boss had promised me a promotion, said he was working on my behalf, that he thought my work was invaluable and his meetings were better focused when I attended. I paused a moment, took a breath, answered the phone. Are you driving? My boss of four years said, no. Are you in a safe, quiet place? Yes. We're having a reduction in force, and I'm afraid you're infected, he said before reciting a boilerplate of legal language so fast it was clear he was well rehearsed in executing layoffs. This action is final, he said, as if I were about to beg. After nine and a half years at the company, in a litany of accomplishments, I was dismissed without a thank you, unlike how they treat employees who quit. Many get parties. Please check your email for the legal forms, he said. I'm unfriending him on Facebook, I thought, as I thanked him, hung up, and checked my email. Subject, very important information. Attachment, release all claims. I agree to compromise, resolve, and settle any dispute I have against the company regarding my termination of employment. I understand that if I agree to the terms of this involuntary separation, I will be awarded a lump sum severance. I agree that this release constitutes a full and complete waiver of claims, wrongful discharge, unfair business practices, emotional distress, claims alleging discrimination, harassment, or violation of equal opportunity laws, or I will not be entitled to my severance money. Over the past year, six friends in my over age, age 50 group were let go from Silicon Valley companies. They are now retired by the corporations where they spent their livelihoods also without a farewell party. In the 1980s, when I started work in high tech, companies offered age-appropriate workers early retirement before cutting anyone. 
I still remember the joy in my older colleagues' faces when they realized they could choose to retire early. I agree to hold harm harmless the company and everyone related to it, or I will not be entitled to the severance money. I will agree that I will not divulge the terms of this agreement to anyone I'm not related to or is not my legal representation. Colleagues contacted me, wanting to know if the rumor was true. But a dedicated, smart, hardworking employee was dismissed. They told me about other victims, entire groups cut. The survivors were more upset than me. But I should have been more worried. My husband was laid off the prior week from a company where he had worked for 17 years. He had eavesdropped on a call with my boss. When I hung up, he looked like a person who had seen his future in the soup kitchen line. We went for a walk to shake off the anxiety swirling in the pits of our stomachs. We counted the months of severance pay and then the invoices for the deck refill, recurring bills, vacation plans to cancel, and the never ending home repair list. We contemplated the absurdity of health insurance being tied to employment. We could make it through July. This was before we knew the pandemic would take hold midway to summer, slowing the job market and everything else. I agree that this is not an admission by the company of any wrongdoing under any law or otherwise. I agree that I will not directly or indirectly say or do anything that would disparage or reflect negatively on the company or I will be sued. On my first day of work at the company, I signed a legal contract sandwiched between the welcome aboard notice and free lunch coupons, binding me to at-will employment. The company could terminate me for any reason given proper notice. On this day of dismissal, I felt betrayed by an inequitable agreement. I felt angry at my boss for lying about my career potential. I felt targeted by the head of my business unit who systematically eliminated long-term employees, replacing them with his acquaintances. I felt outrage at the company for ignoring the nepotism and classifying the action as just business, like no humans were involved in the decision. Surprisingly, I felt vindicated for the sleepless nights spent wondering whether I would be terminated in this round or the next or the next. But most of all, I felt relief. By signing below, I agreed to accept this agreement and receive my severance money. I signed the release, took the money, and found another job. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, and I believe we're down to Chun Yu, and I know I saw her earlier. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Chun Yu is a bi bilingual poet, graphic novelist, and scientist. She's the author of the award-winning memoir, Little Green, Growing Up During the Chinese Cultural Revolution, published by Simon & Schuster, and that is a memoir written in free verse. She is also the author of a historical graphic novel in progress, uh, which is under contract to Macmillan, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And her website is uh, www.chunyu.org. And today, Chunyu is going to be reading for us her story called The Pink Balloon. Thank you, Seth. Thanks to the Mechanic Institute Library, Taryn, for organizing this event. Um, so I'm just going to read my short piece, The Pink Balloon. The first time when father told us about his childhood, he said that when he was 11, after eight years of war, the Japanese surrendered. The day the news came, the city erupted into celebration. In a crowd drunken with joy, he saw a giant pink balloon rising above the ancient city wall by Yangtze River. Telling the story, his eyes glowed with a light rising and expanding like the pink balloon. It was New Year's Eve. Father had just come back 
from his re-education in the countryside. He was gone for eight years. We children did not know him until the light of his pink balloon began to shine upon us that day. I was also 11 then, secretly believed that I could make it, the pink balloon, stay high and above, always glowing for father and us all. I set out to work. Winning mass competitions, being the champion student in our city, going to the best university of the country in the capital. As the years go by, I saw that balloon rising higher and expanding in father and everyone's eyes in our family. Each New Year's Eve, father told the story as we gathered around the banquet that he, our mother, and the grandma spent days preparing with the rationed food and extra allowances of meat, fish, and eggs for the new year that my older brother, Gugu, little sister, Mei Mei, and I stood in different lines of shops for hours to buy. One day, I felt I could change the world for the better so that the balloon could always stay above for us all, our whole family, and for our whole nation. I marched in demonstration with my fellow students. The whole country cheered us on for the pink balloons we all saw in the sky until tanks rolled in and bullets were fired and all the balloons were gone. I came home, we stood in the dark. There was nothing up on the sky. Father did not mention the balloon for years. It took me a long time to look again alone. Marriages happened, grandchildren were born and raised, marriages went awry. Money was made or lost, back and forth. Hopes and losses came and went in different shapes. A few years ago, father began to forgot, forget what he had for breakfast five minutes ago. And if he had taken his medicine and many other things, in his forgetfulness, his face became rosy and some roots of his gray hair grow dark. He began to smile at whatever happened in our family, good or bad, and just say, oh, good, good. Last year's, last New Year's Eve, we all managed to come home. During dinner, father suddenly glowed and said, when I was 11, the Japanese surrendered. A giant pink balloon rose above, above the city wall. I smiled as if seeing the balloon in the sky with him. Yes, father, what a day it must have been. Thank you. Oh, what a touching tribute. Thank you. Thanks. And that brings us to the end of the list that I have, unless someone else has joined us. Karen? No, um, we did have one, one person duck out, so we uh, now have more time to, to chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, all of our readers. Uh, thank you for your timeliness as well and uh, for sharing your work. It takes courage to do. For sure. Does anyone have any comments or uh, uh, anything they'd like to say? You can unmute yourself and 
I'll, I'll speak and I just want to say thank you uh, to the Mechanics Institute, uh, Taryn Yu. And, and I, I especially wanted to say, Lizette, you're a wonderful moderator. You're very oh. warm. You're very kind. You're, you, you, you find a nice thing to, to say beforehand to make us feel more comfortable. And then when we're done, you have something wonderful to say afterwards. Oh, so I just uh, want to tell you that I really enjoyed uh, working with you on this. Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, you can learn a lot from Lizette. She has a class coming up. Um, and I forget the date on that. September 12th. September 12th. Very, very, um, Lizette is a, uh, a repeat um, teacher at Mechanics Institute and one of the writers that I respect the most out of all of the ones that I know, which is a lot. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to find out about that class because I'm sure I could use a little more support. Thank yes, you, Lizette. That. I'll send you the link. <laughs> Are you flash fiction on the 12th? No, it's a professional development class about writing your artist statement. Oh, very Because good. writers need artist statements too, not just visual artists. Yes. And I just want to say I completely agree with Simon, what he had to say that you're very easy to work with, um, both answering our questions before we got here tonight and also tonight. Thank you so much for the intro to Flash Fiction as well, because I think it's uh, for me gonna be uh, making me uh, better as I walk out of here as too. I got something very um, wonderful from you. Good, yeah, that makes me happy. I mean, if you can get that much in a few minutes from somebody, it's like, that's gotta be a really good teacher. <laughs> Thank you. And Taryn just put a link to the uh, artist statement class, which is on September 12th. Okay. I'm not teaching class fiction um, anymore this year. I had taught it earlier this year. I'm teaching lyric essay next, but I will return to class fiction um, probably next year. Okay. I have a meeting on the 12th for like three and a half hours. So do you know what time it is on the 12th? 11 to 3. Yeah. That's a bummer. <laughs> That's the next one. Yeah, she teaches that class. I think you've taught it two or three times now. So yeah. um, she'll be back and she'll be back to do other things too. <laughs> I don't have meetings every day. Oh gosh, don't we all? <laughs> Not every day. Not every day. So I threw it in somewhere. Yeah, no, that was awesome. And I really enjoyed all the other readers. I have to say, that was just incredible. What an array of topics and readers. And it was so much really, really fun. I loved it. Good, yes. I'm so glad. Thank you for having the event and hosting us. You're very welcome. And, and uh, I and Mechanics Institute are super proud of all of you. And I uh, hope that you can, um, I hope you learned from the experience. Yes, I wanted to say thank you as well and, um, and let people know that I have taken one class with Lizette and she is, um, she's not only warm, but during her classes, she gets hot too, so. <laughs> do you now? I do, oh yes. It's been a while since I've seen you in action, Lizette. <laughs> I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so by all means, if you have an opportunity, do take a class with her. She's very encouraging and very knowledgeable. So, and I had a great time when I finally arrived at the party. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you were I'm able to get in. <laughs> yes, and I'm glad I didn't miss any readings because that would have been, that would not have <laughs> made me happy at all. And thank you, Taryn, for hanging in there with me, you know, no problem. knocking on that door for me. So I, could get in. <laughs> I knew we'd get you in here somehow. <laughs> well, thank you. At least I didn't have to come in through the transom. <laughs> I can, I can use that word because, uh, you know, certain people don't know what you're talking about when you mention the transom, so. Oh, we got them in, at, at every door at Mechanics Institute. <laughs> yes, that's true, because I'm also a Mechanics uh, Institute uh, groupie, so. <laughs> that's good. We need, we need all the groupies we can get, and we appreciate it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you. 
Oops, sorry. Oh, hi, oh. Jen. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, both of you again uh, for this really fun event. And also, it was great to listen to all of the all the writers. Um, uh, it's the Zoom readings become so important during our time. It's, it's, it's really hard. We have to stay connected. Yeah. Okay. I, I just also want to mention that um, I have another. Yes. So Taryn just. Uh, I'm on it. <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with her and the McKenna Institute Library on the stem, September the 3rd um, with poet Michael War. And we have this project called Two Languages, One Community. Mm -hmm. We bring African American uh, uh, and the Chinese American communities together in poetry writing and the storytelling. So in that event, we will share our event, uh, share our project and our poetry, both of our poetry bilingually in Chinese and English. So please join us. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we are delighted to be hosting Chan and her, her writing partner and friend, uh, Michael yeah. War. We're a project. We are not writing partners. We're project partners. But we do. I mean, I mean, I translate his poetry. That's true. But we don't write together. You don't write together? Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. We don't write a piece together. No, we don't. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're always talking and together <laughs> at Mechanics always. Institute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, anyway, so that is September 3rd at 6 o'clock. I put the link to that also in the chat space. And, um, I and just the, registered. I just registered. <laughs> good. good the, for you. The two well, of them are, are individually fascinating, but their um, creative, uh, joint creative spark is, um, is really something to uh, experience. And um, both of them are, you know, hyper local mm -hmm. uh, San Franciscans. And so I hope you can uh, join us on September. All right. Taryn and Chum, is this the same Michael Ware who used to be at Moad? Yes. yes. He, okay. Yeah, he used to be uh, mm -hmm. the uh, deputy uh, director. Yes, uh -huh. Moad, but, yeah, a while yeah. ago. Yeah, so you, you know him. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful project. Yeah, we've been working on it for three years. Um, Very nice. Different organizations with Oakland Asian Culture Center, then Chinese Culture center of San Francisco. Yes. Yeah, so we are expanding it. I mean, now, yeah, yeah. We are just constantly working on it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Let us know when you publish. Yeah, we have, uh, we put a little book together for our participants um, mm -hmm. in the Open Culture Center workshop. Yeah, it's on our website, yeah. It's Good. called language one community in one word.com. I mean, we're still building it, but the book is on it. It's you can flip. Like, it's oh, flip, flip oh flip very good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I would love to see you guys then. <laughs> thank you all for your very moving readings. Um, it's a it's a tough time. We we all need to take care for many, many challenging reasons, right? Yeah. Yes, and it just keeps getting tougher, right? Yes. Now? Yeah. Yes. Well, I wrote my piece for my um, father, who I, I, my parents, I cannot see them because the COVID-19 and the two countries are at each other's throat. And it's epic. So hard. Free fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really saddening. Yeah. Yeah, really hard. I, I don't know when will be realistic for me to go back. Mm. Yeah, but I know so many parent people are separate from their family. Even for my friends who have have parents living in another state, it's not that easy to to go and see them. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. You know, I I um I have dealt with the the pandemic in one other short story that's also YA. And I think it's because my niece who just graduated and I have some young friends who are just graduating from high school. Uh, you know, the, the, youth, the youth are really suffering right now, almost more than anybody else in some ways, because 
they're being ripped from what we all got as 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 youth and young people in our in our experience to a greater or lesser extent they're not getting that experience and they're being pushed into a world that's online they're being you know they they don't get their you know proms or their dates or their dances or their whatever and i just have such uh, a, a sympathy a heart for for young people and they're you know they're having to be strong mm -hmm. at a time when they you know it, they shouldn't have to be but that's the way life is mm, yeah i'm i'm i really feel so sympathetic towards them because they are you know they're young they should be out <laughs> right and, remember when we we were out <laughs> we were crazy and they can't be they can't you know? yeah it's it's tough yeah. but yeah i don't know if it's ever the world is ever going to recover to what we had before well i mean i don't sound very optimistic but i think we'll be changed <laughs> i think we'll be changed but i i believe in our resilience but mm -hmm. this is war this is this is the kind of the way i look at it it's the kind of uh shift seismic shift that happens like during a world war you know, where all of a sudden, you know, a bomb drops in a restaurant that was there is now gone forever. That might have been successful mm -hmm. even, and now it's gone forever. Except instead of a bomb, it's, it's, the, it's the pandemic and closing of a restaurant. Or Sometimes. We seem to get the same people, doesn't it? It gets the young and it gets the old and it gets the marginalized. Mm -hmm. And it's doing that now and yeah. it was reflected in our stories too, I think. Yes. Well, with the decline of the middle class in America, so many people have no safety net whatsoever. Yes. Well, we used to have a, a robust middle class, and now we have, you know, the extremely wealthy, and those people who would have been middle class are now without a paycheck at all. Mm. And, you know, after many, many years of living paycheck to paycheck, just scrimping by to suddenly have no paycheck, it's horrible. And there's this tremendous wave of evictions that's coming our way, yep. which is, I just can't even fathom it. I used to tell my son, when I was growing up, we didn't have homeless people. And the churches and the synagogues never closed. Mm. The church door was always open. But with the advent of the various um, drugs that have been flooded into, ver into the communities of color and then throughout the whole United States, it is unbelievable. People are not willing to take their addicted children back in mm. because things disappear. They sell grandma's, you know, wedding band for a fix. Mm. So this is the big change. But am I angry at people about that? No, I'm not. What I'm angry at is no one has been held accountable for this travesty, this flood of prescription drugs. No one has done the perp walk, and I am very angry about that. It's the same thing with the housing debacle. No one is being held responsible. Hmm. So that's my rant for the day. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good one. And now we can't even go outside because of the smoke. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. You guys have smoke up there? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's it's smoke. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Really yeah. bad. And oh, that's I right. It's Northern California. So, yeah. Yeah. Back yes. I'm in a city where we don't have air conditioning, so I've got to have the windows open, but mm -hmm. I can't leave them open for too long because my nose and throat will start hurting, especially early in the morning. And like now, it's starting to get more. Wow, guys, that's yeah. terrible. I've got my fans on, but um, it, it's. You know, we go through this, it looks like every summer, it, it seems to be now. Yeah. 
Right. I mean, before we never think about fire. I mean, I used to work in in uh, my. I used to work for a medical device company, Medtronic, in in the north. Mm -hmm. I mean, for 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 a while, nobody thought about fire. Now it's like every year you think about fire. Yeah, Mm -hmm. like ever since um, I walked out of the hospital one morning after doing a twelve-hour shift and. 11.30, 11.30, I walked out, and there was the big Oakland Hills on fire mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. San Francisco. And a cookbook page was found on the concrete mm. Ooh, from across the bay. Wow. And that's a story right there. That's yeah, that's, a, there oh, is. Yeah, story. Yeah, ever since then, it's been like almost every single year, these huge, ginormous fires, you know. It's just, and today... Like, this is a fake background, obviously, a photo I took years ago, but it's calming. And, but the, it's so smoky up here today. I'm up in the Lafayette Hills, and my eyes were like beet yep. red before this meeting. I'm like drenching them with, you know, visine. But yeah. there's no climate change. Oh, no. <laughs> no there's no climate change. It's oh, all a hoax. They're sending us to our rooms. We've got to figure this out. Mm, you know, we we must we figure it out. Footprints. We got to work through these things. We got to. Yes. Yeah, it's parts. it's crazy the way we live now. I mean, just how much garbage we produce. I I am a polymer scientist. I I know it's not. I I did degradable biodegradable materials, but what we are using are not degradable. No. And it just we are in huge huge trouble for that. There is zero doubt about it. We are, but like yeah. it's not changing. No. And, you know, we have an electric car, we have solar panels, we have a, two big Tesla batteries just for the car. We probably wouldn't know it necessarily if the electricity did go out. We give back to our neighbors with our electricity. But even so, the trash for two people, come on, mm-hmm. for just two people. And I try to compress it and everything, but even so, it's like, come on. Well, it's also, you know, the speaking of trash, the amount of mail we all receive. I mean, like 30 years ago, you know, I heard somebody say, you know, um, the average American gets in the course of a week or two what our grandparents got in a year. (laughs) Amazing. Yeah, none of it is letters. (laughs) No, 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 none of it is handwritten, you know, and, and, and our kids don't even know how to write cursive, so. That's right, that's right. Well, thinking about that, I'm thinking about beginning to write my parents' letters again, because they, I haven't done a handwritten letter for... Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I used to write, when I was in college, I used to write to them like three times a week. Oh, how nice. That's- <laughs> we send... We send our grandkids uh, letters and we, we do it purposefully in, in writing and cursive and it's our secret language with the grandkids. <laughs> they, enjoy it as a, they enjoy it as a secret language, but I don't think they'll have that much use for it other than that. Although I hope they, they, that they still will. Well, you're getting a handwritten letter is such a delight. It is. You know, yeah. and so to have that with your grandchildren, that's just fabulous. It's a gift. We send our grandchildren little things like this, you know, because so, he's so big on animals and, mm-hmm. you know, different animals that they have. And he wants now to do reading with us on Zoom. He's in Hawaii. So nice. We, we came up with these different fiction stories. Mm-mm. He wants to read the animal encyclopedia, the encyclopedia of animals. So we're giving us the encyclopedia of animals and him a copy of the encyclopedia of animals. <laughs> he's very smart but you know that's what he likes he loves it when we send him these animal cards these are all baby animals he has a little sister so he's really interested in baby the baby elephant <laughs> <laughs> all right well i want to thank you all for coming and sharing your your oh post-pandemic God. thoughts <laughs> even in, it's comforting uh, even in uh in this sort of casual way. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, it is comforting.
Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sharon. Thank, thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Have a nice evening. Thanks, and, you thanks know, everyone. Nice to, nice to meet you all. Likewise. Bye. 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 Bye.